The Benedict Challenge is all about sustainable habit formation, a keepable rhythm of fasting. And to get there, we're going to need quite a bit of supernatural grace for this supernatural transformation. With that said, we also do not need to avoid ways to make this transition easier. Our ancestors might be a little bit embarrassed or ashamed of how hard we modern people find it just to skip a single meal. But I'm still recommending that starting off this program, you go with an overnight fast, 12 hours, strictly enforced. And the good news is that regardless of where you're starting on your journey, you can safely stop eating for much longer than 12 hours. The bad news is that if you've been eating a standard American diet that's supplying you with a steady supply of sugar and carbohydrates as your primary fuel substrate, then it's gonna be difficult to transition and switch over to relying on your own body's stores of fat to get through your longer fasts. To understand why fasting is so hard for modern people, we need to understand a little bit about fasting metabolism, our hormones, how we store energy and burn it, and the biochemistry of all of these things. But before we dive into the science of insulin and other hormones, I wanna start off just with some practical advice. Start off your day with a better breakfast. What do I mean by a better breakfast? Each day you wake up in a fasted state. Break fast, quite simply, is any food intake that breaks your fast. Most people feel hungry on waking up because they're used to having breakfast at that time. But this was never a biological imperative for our ancestors. You can imagine that they might have woken up, they didn't have refrigeration or a way to store food overnight, so they had to actually work for their food or go out and find it. And in Adalbert de Vogue's time, he questioned this justification that well, maybe the Mediterranean people were able to skip breakfast, but in the cold climate of Northern Europe, where people were doing labor to get their food, this was a, a necessary invention or innovation, if you will. But this didn't quite sit right with de Vogue, and he questioned that breakfast was actually the most important meal of the day, as we've been taught. He found that he was always sharpest when he went longer without eating food, getting even sharper and sharper throughout the day. So even though we're hungry in the morning, this is actually one of the worst times to eat because it breaks our fast and it snaps those low insulin levels that are getting our body into that fat burning mode where we're no longer digesting the food in our stomach and in our bloodstream, but instead relying on our own body's stores. In more modern times, breakfast became a luxury of the rich, a way to flaunt wealth, this form of conspicuous consumption and the carbohydrate rich foods like these fine pastries were especially lavish. And eventually, once the poor could afford to eat a similar breakfast, they started to copy the rich, thinking that it would make them better off. But in fact, it's been the leading driver of illness ever since. And the most common way to break the fast is with some combination of juice, toast, muffins, cereals, pastries. And these are among the worst things you can eat first thing in the morning. Instead, I'm proposing that you try a high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet, aka a ketogenic diet, to keep your insulin levels low first thing, get you in that fat-burning mode. You can still enjoy a filling, fat-filled breakfast of bacon and eggs, a cheesy, buttery omelet, cream in your coffee. All of these things will keep your insulin levels low and act as sort of a fast-mimicking state. So we'll be talking more about habit formation later on, but it's important for now to remember that when you wake up, you have a certain cue. That cue is your hunger from being used to eating. That cue you normally reply to with an action that gives you a reward. These sugary cereals and juices are a perfect example. We need to reprogram ourselves to get a different kind of reward initially, one that is not quite so addictive and that doesn't spike our insulin. A fatty breakfast will do that with a very satiating reward and this will be a perfect intermediate step on the way to going without breakfast altogether. I want you to try this as an experiment. Go ahead and get out your frying pan, put two tablespoons of butter, ideally grass-fed butter, but it doesn't have to be, crack three eggs in there, and slice up some cheese. It doesn't have to be too thin, but put that right on top of the eggs. Go ahead and scramble it up or mix it up like you would in any sort of scrambled eggs or omelet. And then, in the end, add a little salt and pepper maybe some low-carb ketchup or hot sauce to finish it off. 
the butter and the cheese are gonna add healthy fats to the protein from the eggs. You could even add a few slices of pre-cooked bacon if you're not doing the strict observance of the Benedict challenge with no four-legged animals. This will fill you up easily until lunchtime, if not dinner time, giving you a clean source of energy to rely on without spiking your insulin, keeping you in that fast mimicking ketogenic state. Give it a try and tell me how it goes.